So thank you very much for the kind invitation and the introduction. I have to be honest, just uh, dinner last night was worth the whole trip to Trieste. It was really nice. Um, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is actually how our lab, or what my lab has actually been mostly involved in, is the development of a novel technology, uh, zinc finger nucleases. And how I think we have made a major contribution on improving the technology. And I think we are now at a place where we really can apply it in gene therapy. So what I would like to do in this next uh, 30, 40 minutes is actually uh, to talk about targeted genome engineering, so why and how we do it. Then I'm talking about activity and toxicity of zinc finger nucleases, and I will get into some parameters that actually determine the specificity of nucleases. And then probably also beyond uh, the major applications of zinc finger nucleases have been gene correction and gene disruption, but I will uh, also present some data that show that we can actually go beyond this point and uh, have a novel application range of zinc finger nucleases. And uh, eventually, we'll also talk about risk-benefit analysis with AV vectors uh, that we use to actually to shuttle in the zinc finger nucleus and the donors for gene correction into cells. So why do we need such a technology? And uh, this is a, a study that has been conducted mostly in Germany, which is a gene replacement therapy for X-linked uh, chronic granulomatous disorder. And what is nice about uh, this disease is actually that the molecular mechanism is well known. So it's known that a loss of function in any of these proteins which are involved here in this NADPH oxidase complex leads to uh, dysfunctional uh, phagocytes. And this then actually leads to uh, patients uh, mostly suffering from bacterial infection, recurrent bacterial infections, and uh, fungal infections. So in the case of the X-linked uh, CGD, GP91, GP91 here is the protein which is affected. And in a gene therapy trial, uh, which was mainly led by Manuel Gretz, they actually uh, isolated uh, hematopoietic stem cells from CGD patients, then shuttled in a retroviral vector, which expressed this therapeutic protein in that case, and then transfused back the gene-replaced cells into patients. And they had very nice success in the beginning, as you can see here, uh, with this Nature Medicine paper, where they actually showed that they can correct phenotype of these patients. But a few years later, they also see that the, the trial had some problems. They actually observed genomic instability and also uh, activation of proto-oncogenes. So what happens, just in a nutshell, is more or less this. So when they tried to identify the insertion sites of the retroviral vector, they could actually see that insertion of the dominant clones they isolated in these patients were close to proto-oncogenes, meaning they had an activation of nearby proto-oncogenes. On the other side, what they also observed is when they looked at transgene expression of the therapeutic protein, they actually see that the promoter was silenced here, as you can see here from, from this methylation analysis. So meaning that on one side, you have activation of proto-oncogene. On the other side, you had sa silencing of your therapeutic transgene. And I think one way to actually s circumvent these problems is, of course, uh, precise genome engineering. So, one of the long-term aims, of course, in, in our lab is to actually use a gene targeting approach based on um, homology combination to actually replace a mutation in the genome by the wild type sequence. And then you go from a, let's say, a mutated gene A to a corrected gene A. The main advantage is, is of course, that gene, the corrected gene A is still under control of the endogenous promoter, as you can see here. But on the downside, the frequency of homology combination, this event here, is very low. And also, random integration of the same donor molecule is very high. So what has been become more and more evident over the last few years is that you can actually stimulate this rare event here by inserting a double stem break in your target locus. And if you do so, you can actually see that the frequency of homology combination Now, when we look into, the spe let's say, the parameter that influences now the outcome of such a gene targeting event, it's, of course, uh, the specificity of your ar artificial nucleases. The, m the less specificity you have, the more toxicity you will have. Then also the accessibility of the target locus. I'm not going to show anything here. But then the design of the donor. Better donors, uh, you will get higher frequency of gene targeting. And also the cell cycle, or in other words, the availability of DNA repair factors in your 
gene targeting approach. And why is the cell cycle so important in, in that approach? Now, when you induce a double stem break, of course, within minutes, the cell will raise an immune, uh, let's say, a DNA repair response to actually seal this broken chromosome as quickly as possible. And the cell has actually two ways to do so. You can either just rejoin the two broken ends, and this is a very quick process, which actually usually happens in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. As I said, it's fast, but it's also error prone, meaning that during this re-ligation step, small insertions and deletions can be inserted into the site of the break here. On the other hand, the cell can actually recruit a sequence which is homologous to the target locus in, in natural situation that's the cystochrome it did here. And then use the cystochrome that as a template for repairing the double stem break through homologous recombination. This usually takes place in the S and the G G2 phase of the cell cycle. So this is a very slow process, but it's also a very precise process. And this very uh, hmm. okay, let's do it this way. So this very processes can also be ha uh, harnessed now to do genome engineering in the cell, meaning that if you insert a double stem break in your gene of interest, you will uh, the cell will actually mostly seal the break by NHEJ, which will lead to uh, short mutations or insertions here at, at this site, and this leads then to gene disruption. On the other hand, if you provide now a cell with a donor molecule which shares homology to your target site, the cell will actually use this donor molecule here as a template for repair, and then you actually can transfer sequences from, from your donor to your target site, and uh, this is then what we call gene targeting or gene correction. So, why the cell cycle is important here is this, this is what I said before. In the G1 phase of the cell cycle, the repair factors that there are most available are repair factors that immediate NHEJ, while in the S phase or the G2 phase of the cell cycle, more of the HR repair proteins are available. So I will come back to this point later on. So what you need now to actually do genome engineering in the cell is, of course, you need the artificial nucleases, which we have to design. And then you need some vector system to shuttle in your components, meaning the nuclease expression vector and the donor molecule. So what kind of nucleases are available? We mostly work with zinc finger nucleases. This will be the main topic of my talk, but just to be complete here, uh, there are also other nucleases. Uh, they are called homing endonucleases, which are based on uh, intron encoded meganucleases uh, or some chemical approaches which actually uh, use uh, oligonucleotides, which then can form a triplex uh, with the uh, DNA helix here, and then you can hook up here a nuclease domain to your oligonucleotide, and this also can induce double stem breaks. But just to be, uh, to summarize this very quickly, the zinc finger nuclease, of course, have been the most successful in of all of these. That's why we work with them. So what is a zinc finger nuclease? This is just a very schematic drawing here. You can see it consists of two subunits. This is the one and this is the other one. And each subunit here in orange or in yellow has an engineered DNA binding domain. And this consists of individual zinc finger modules. Here, one, two, three, one, two, three. And each of these modules actually recognizes three bases on the DNA level. So meaning that what is known from the structure of these zinc fingers is just a few amino acids in this zinc finger are actually uh, contacting the DNA. And by just changing a few of these amino acids in this region here, you can change the specificity of a zinc finger protein. Meaning just you can design zinc fingers just based on your needs uh, to target a specific locus in the genome. So the second domain here is in green, is the endonuclease domain, which is activated upon dimerization. So that's why we need two subunits. And when we look at the statistics now of our zinc finger nuclease in terms of DNA binding specificity, we target nine bases here, nine bases here, meaning that, that the whole target site will be 18 base pairs, which should define a unique site in the human genome. So what can you do? This is what I said before. You can use them for gene disruption in the absence of a donor. You can use them for gene correction, or depending on your donor design here, you can also insert a whole expression set here into a targeted site in the human genome. So this is what we call on-target activity. But what you also have, of course, 
is that the zinc finger nuclei are not completely specific, so they will insert mutations at off-target sites, which can be mutagenic and can also lead to cytotoxicity. And when we, we have developed several assays to actually measure this off-target effects, which are, for instance, based on genotoxicity, meaning that we can actually visualize double cell breaks in the cell using an antibody directed against the gamma H2AX protein, which then is, is uh, recruited to this repair foci. And just by counting the foci, you have some idea how many double cell breaks you actually introduce when expressing these nucleases. What you can also do is measuring apoptosis. You mean you can induce a lot of apoptosis if you use a nonspecific nuclease, or you just measure cell survival when you overexpress these nucleases, and just counting the cells that actually survive overexpression of these nucleases. So these are just assays that we use just to give, or let's say to have an idea how specific are our nucleases. So as, just to repeat that, what we need is zinc finger nucleases which have more on target activity than off target activity and on the donor side, and this will be the last topic then of my talk, we need of course donors that are used for homology combination, do not randomly integrate somewhere in the genome. These are now platforms that are used to engineer these artificial zinc finger proteins and I would just like to spend some minutes here. So there is a, a platform which is called module assembly and the basic assumption here is that each of these zinc finger mod, uh, zinc fingers here are completely modular, meaning that you can pre-screen them in vitro, for instance, and then you would, if this is your target site here, would just take the zinc fingers here that have been pre-screened, assemble them in an array, and this will then be your engineered DNA binding domain. Of course, this is very simple and fast because you just rely on pre-screened zinc fingers and no selection is involved at this stage here. The quality is very variable, but they have been shown to work in Drosophila and also in C. elegans. This is another approach here, which is based on a selection method, meaning in that, the, the basic idea here is that the zinc fingers are not truly modular, meaning that it is, uh, binding depends on the position of a zinc finger in the array, so meaning one, two, or three, and also it depends what are the neighboring zinc fingers, meaning that not each zinc finger here can work with one of these neighbors here. So you really have to do a pre-screening to find zinc fingers that work well in position one to recognize this triplet here. And then you have to do a second screening here to actually find zinc fingers now that work well together. So that of course, this is very labor intense and involves the selection of large libraries. And then there is also commercial source, which is uh, based on a proprietary platform from Sangamon Biosciences here. We don't know exactly what they do, but we know that the quality is actually quite good. So when we started, we of course used the most easy platform, which is modular assembly. And this is now just an in vitro cleavage assay. And it, it shows you all the problems that we faced in the beginning. So this is, was, is a, a target DNA. This is the target site here for one zinc fingers up unit. And this is the other one here. And what we did here is just incubate this DNA fragment here with in vitro translated proteins that these two proteins here, and what you get is what you see here. You get very efficient cleavage of your DNA fragments. So this is now another sample here where we just expressed one subunit but not the other. And what you can see here is also some cleavage reaction. And what we actually tried to find out is what happened here. And then we actually found a second target site which has some similarity. So this is a complete match here, and this is a some, somewhat similar sequence here. So meaning that the zinc finger was not specific enough, it binds here as well, and then it actually cleaved the DNA fragment as a homodimer, meaning two subunits, these two subunits are identical. This is what we see here. But what we also see here is these bands here, meaning they are the same as here. So meaning that there must be an additional cleavage site here. And then we actually looked at the sequence, and what we found was that probably this can be bound as well for, by the zinc finger nucleus, but the, the spacing in between the two binding sites is not the same. So what we actually concluded from this experiment is that we made zinc finger arrays which are not specific enough. We have a nuclease domain which also works as a homodimer, which is the problem here. And then we have uh, this a small, a small link that connects the two domains, has also some influence in space of promiscuity, meaning that it does not always cleave at the canonical six space pair space here, but also the 11 base pair spacer. So these are all 
facts that we try to improve over the next years then. So then we actually compare platforms, meaning what is better now, module assembly or the selection-based method, as you can see here. This is uh, what, how we approach this question is we made in collab collaboration with Keith Jung, sync finger nucleus against the EGFP and the five different positions here. And then we wanted to overexpress them, insert gene disruption in GFP, and then we go from a green cell to a white cell. And this was the outcome of this experiment here. So these are the five target sites where we made sync finger nucleases against. And you can see here, the red bars indicate sync fingers made by modular assembly and the green bars, sync fingers made by the selection system. And you can see for all of these sites that what, ca what came out of the screen was much better than modular assembly here. So a very simple conclusion here. You probably have to go through the screening method, which is a lot of work, but you, what you get out is actually much better than what you get here with this modular assembly method. What you can also see here is that also the target site looked good on the paper. There are some sequences which cannot be targeted by sync finger nuclease, and we don't know exactly what happens here. And i give you another example where we actually measured the affinity, and we just focus on this one here. So this is a sync finger nuclease called EB0, which is the original one. This is the specificity here, meaning that it binds the sync finger binds about 7,000 times more likely to the target site than to an off-target site. And these are uh, sync fingers that came out of the screen, EB1 and EB2, so slightly different versions of the same sync finger. And you can see that the, the increase here in the specificity. Now, when we do now gene targeting, and this is an asset that we always do to um, assess the um, activity of our sync finger nuclease, meaning that we have a in, integrated in the genome a uh, mutated EGFP, this is this one here, and close to the mutation we have the binding sites for the sync finger, so we express the sync fingers that will induce a double cell break, then we offer a donor to actually correct this GFP. So meaning in that case you go from a white cell to a green cell. Then you just measure how many green cells you have after transfection, and as I said, just we focus on this one here. So this is the original one here, and you can see here a huge increase in the activity of the sync finger nuclease, meaning uh, you go, you have about probably a 50 to 100 fold increase in the activity just by slightly improving the specificity here. And when we look at toxicity here, this is now relative cell survival. After overexpression of the same thing nucleus, you can see, of course, the contrary effect. You have more cells that actually survive uh, overexpression of same thing nucleus, meaning, again, that specificity improves activity, but it also decreases the toxicity. So why is that? So why are modular assembled sync finger nucleases not working as well as the sync fingers that come out of the screen? And of course, the, qu the answer is very simple. Sync fingers are not truly modular. So this is what we th thought is actually the case. So as I said before, each sync finger recognizes three bases on the DNA level. But what actually happens is that there are some amino acids which also recognize a fourth base. And in the opposite strand of DNA, meaning this nucleotide here will actually uh, let's say this amino acid will bind to an A, so meaning that here it has to be a T, and if the T is not present, the sync finger doesn't have a good specificity. So this, and this is just another way to look at it, this is the sync finger, you actually can see, these are the target site here, and this amino acid here actually determines uh, what this triplet has to be, and if this is not matching here, the sync finger will not bind properly. So meaning we really have to go through a screening method, and this is just a very simple uh, way to look at the screen. I don't want to go into details, but this is about three months of work. In the end, you get some colonies, and then you screen these colonies where they contain sync fingers that bind to your target site. And again, in collaboration with Keith Jung, he provided us with a lot of his sync finger nucleases. Uh, this assay works very nicely. This is just one example here for in vitro activity of an open, now with a selection-based sync finger nuclease uh, directed against the human CFTR locus. Uh, it cleaves close to a mutation in exon 10 in the CFTR gene, and you can see here, this is just the uh, amplification of exon 10. You incubate this with in vitro translated uh, sync finger nuclease, and you can see here the cleavage product, meaning that you have very efficient cleavage in vitro here. Of course, the sync finger nuclease also work in cells. Now, this is a gene targeting approach, just a proof of concept here, where you had on the donor a target site for a restriction and the nuclease, which we then insert into the genome. You can do PCR 
on this exon here, and then you just cleave it with the restriction enzyme, and then you can estimate the frequency of gene targeting. You can see here, this is a zinc finger nucleus direct against the VEGFA locus. In that case, we had about 7% or 7 to 8% of alleles targeted at this position here, about 4 to 5%. Now, I told you before that the cell cycle is very important. Now, when, you, when we used Vim Blastin to actually transiently arrest the cells in the G2 phase, you can see that gene targeting just goes out of the roof, more or less. You go from 7.5% to over 50% gene targeting just by transiently arresting the cells in G2. So it has a very strong effect here on the gene targeting frequency. These are just the overall success rates that we published in this paper. You can see here different target loci and different frequencies of gene targeting in the absence of wind blasting or in the presence of wind blasting here. So, now this is a, a sync finger nucleus that we just designed according to published data from Sangamo. So you can see it's slightly different. These are four fingers now on each side. And they actually target the ABS1 locus. And I think a lot of people work with AV, so they know that this is the integration side of AV2. And it's considered to be a safe harbor in the human genome. And we actually wanted to know, can we reproduce this sync finger nucleus and do it actually cleave in the genome? This is the assay that we used here, just in 293 cells. You express these nucleases. They will induce now, in the absence of a donor, they will induce mutations at the cleavage site. You PCR out the, the, uh, this region here. And during your PCR, in your last step, you can create heteroduplex DNA because now the mutation will not match the wild type sequence. Then you can use a specific endonucleus that recognizes these mismatches here. And this will just give you an estimate how efficiently you actually cleave the target site in cells. And I, I think an estimate would be about 10 to 20% in that case here. But does it also work for gene targeting? So we have made this donor here to, that will be in, inserting an EGFP cDNA into a AVS1 locus. And then we just uh, PCR it out to see whether we actually have gene targeting happening in these cells. These are now K562 cells. We use different amounts of zinc finger nuclease and donor. And as you can see, in one instance here, a lot of zinc fingers and little donor, we actually can detect gene targeting here. We used a, a transfection method, I have to stress this, which was very suboptimal, as you can see here. Only 4.5% of the cells were actually transfected with the donor. But this was very fortunate for us, because then we actually tried, can we actually select for gene targeting events using this neomycin resistance gene that we co-introduced into the locus? And that what you can see here, over time, in the presence of selection, we can go from 4.5% to 58 or 84% over time, and you can also see that you go actually from nothing here, detectable, after five days we have a band, after 19 days we have a very strong band, meaning that we can really increase uh, the frequency, or let's say, for gene targeting events using a simple selection method. And I think in a therapeutic approach, as you can see here, we flux this selection cassette here, a lox P side, meaning that we can actually remove this side later on if you want to use it in a therapeutic approach. So, just to summarize this part here, what we actually could show is that when we improve the specificity of DNA binding, we can improve the zinc finger nucleus activity on the target side, and we can decrease zinc finger nucleus associated toxicity. Um, I will show you just some results now that actually show that when we redesign the nucleus domain, we lose some of the zinc finger nucleus activity, but what is more important here, we actually significantly improve the specificity. And the last point is also that we actually improved this very small linker domain here, which also improved the specificity of these zinc finger nucleases. And I think we are now actually, with our technology, uh, in a position where we can actually get gene editing frequency in human cell lines, I have to say, between 1 and 50%. So this was gene disruption and gene targeting. And as I said in the beginning, there might be an additional approach which might be useful in, to answer biological questions, but maybe also in a therapeutic uh, way, is that you can actually insert chromosomal deletions when you express two zinc finger nucleases at the same time. And they would cleave next to each other, and then you would actually loop out the whole sequence in between here. So you delete, or you might be able to delete a large genomic locus here. So when you think about the problems that are associated with this approach is that when you express one zinc finger nuclease pair and you use just the, the wild type nuclease domain here, 
uh, you can get heterodimers, but you can also get homodimers in a cell because you have two subunits. If you express two pairs, you will now have 12 different possible combinations in a cell. And each of these combinations might, might actually induce off-target DNA double cell breaks and lead to mutations. So meaning what you have to do, and this has already been shown before, is that you, what we did is actually, you can create an asymmetry in the dimerization domain, which is indicated by the plus and the minus here, meaning that you actually prevent homodimerization from taking place. But still, when you express two sink finger nuclease pairs, you will still have four possible combinations. And what we actually try to do here is to, to find a second asymmetry in these dimerization domains that actually would create autonomous sink finger nuclease pair which cannot cross-react with each other anymore. So that we really come down to two possible combinations only. So just to give you some idea what I'm talking about. So this is just a schematic of a sink finger nuclease in green and in, in yellow you see the sink finger sitting on top of the DNA. These are the two nuclease domains here and this here, these alpha helices here, is actually the dimerization domain. And what we know from structural analysis is that there are elect electrostatic interactions which bring these two domains together, so positively and negatively charged amino acids. And there are also hydrophobic interactions which actually stabilize the dimer, which are usually isoleucines here. So meaning that what we could show uh, two or three years ago is that, as I said before, if we create an asymmetry, and these are now the two uh, subunits here in yellow and in blue, this is the wild type configuration. What we did is actually that we took uh, one of these pairs, as you can see here, or now this one here actually, so we just swapped the two charged amino acids. So this red one will, will be now on the blue side here, and the green one will now be on the yellow side here. So we, we go from this situation to this situation here, and this prevents homodimerization. And then we actually also try to reduce the dimer, dimerization energy between the, the two interfaces here, just by mutating some of the isoleucines. So we go from a strong interaction to a weak interaction. And both actually, what we could show, improve the specificity of the nucleases. And th this is not important here, but these are the mutations that we made and that we published. And this is the mutations that uh, were published by Sangwo Biosciences. And this, as you can see here, pair B and pair C are very similar. So they, ca they came to very similar conclusions as we did. So now, just based on these published uh, asymmetries, can we now combine them and see and just make sure that they don't interact with each other? This again, this is pair A, B, and C. This is the wild type configuration, and in, in color here you can see the mutations. So this is a, just an in vitro translation, just to make sure that all the proteins are expressed to the same level. And then we did again in vitro cleavage assays with a DNA fragment and the sink fingers here, the different target sites, see whether they cut as a heterodimer or whether they also can cleave as a homodimer. You can see here, this is the outcome. Um, this is the mock without sink finger nuclease, and these are the two cleavage products that you get with wild type and all the three pairs here. So this seems to work very nicely. Do they work as homodimers? You can see here, pair A, C, and B that do not cleave as homodimers, only wild type can do so here and also here. Meaning that what we can show here is that really all these pairs are obligate heterodimeric sink finger nuclease pairs. Now, I don't want to go into too many details here, but we then did in silico calculations just based on the protein models that we had. And what you can see here is, this is wild type, wild type. And this is the, the energy that you calculate, the dimerization energy. And you can see A and A, or B and B, and C and C should work very well with, with regard to dimerization. And what the, the prediction would be that A and C and A and B do not dimerize anymore with each other, while B and C still can. So we tried to prove that in the in vitro cleavage assay that I showed you before. And what you can see here, for all the blue configurations, you see cleavage. For all the green configurations, you don't see cleavage as predicted. And for the red combinations, you actually see cleavage again. So just, it really confirmed what we predicted here in our in silico model. Um, it is not so surprising that B and C actually interact with each other, as I said before. They just are different in these isoleucine variants here. But as you can see here, the charged amino acid mutations are exactly the same. So meaning that they, these guys here can still interact with each other. 
So now the question is how do they work in, in, in cells? And again, we did our GFP rescue assay where we actually looked whether they can rescue the GFP mutation. And what you can see here in blue, just we focus on blue here, this is wild type configuration. In that case, we can uh, rescue tw uh, EGFP in 12% of transfected cells. BB and CC did quite well. But what you can see here, the AA pair did not perform very well. So there is some problem probably associated with AA also, although uh, this was, is actually the pair that we need because it does not cross react with B and C. So, we, so may, maybe there is a problem with uh, protein stability, but that's not the case here. This is a Western blot. It shows you that A is expressed to the same level. So we thought, okay, maybe it's just this drop here in the energy. So we actually tried to address this by increasing the salt concentration in our in vitro assay. And what you can see now is when you go from 50 millimolar salt to 150 millimolar salt, that cleavage cannot take place anymore. So it, it was fine for B and C, as you can see here, but A did not cleave anymore. So meaning that under physiological conditions, this, coming, this variant here was very bad. So meaning that we had to do something to increase the energy again. And this is what we did here. So we just reversed these mutations here back to wild type, but then actually thought that pair zero, as you call it, might do the job. So we did the in silico calculations, and just based on the in silico calculations, this looked very good. So zero, zero has a very high energy here. And again, zero and B and zero and C shouldn't work. This was exactly what we saw here in the in vitro cleavage assay. Sorry. Also under high salt concentrations, uh, pair zero was able to cleave the DNA. And what you can see here, in combination with pair B and pair C, this thing, finger nucleus, did not work anymore. So meaning that this seems to be now a truly autologous thing, finger nucleus pair. And you can see also in terms of the GFP rescue assay, zero, zero worked very well as compared to wild type, and all these combinations here did not work, so as predicted. So meaning now that we are now at a stage where we actually have two pairs, pair zero and pair B, combination one, or pair zero and pair C, which should be autonomous. And we actually looked where this is the case for this pair here. So the aim of this study here was then to actually insert the deletion now in exon one of the HOXB13 locus. And you can see here, these are the two target sites in exon one. These are the sync fingers that bind here. And then what we would like to see is just the very small deletions here of about 170 base pair. And here you see the different combinations that we tested. So this is a configuration BBBB. So these are cross-reacting sync finger nucleases. This is a combination BB and 00. So they should be autonomous, not cross-reacting. And this was just uh, to really make the point that these guys here cannot interact with each other. So meaning here nothing should happen. So when we look now at the frequency of deletion in 293 cells or HeLa cells, this is what you can see here. So this is the wild type allele here in a PCR, and this is the deleted allele here. And you can see just based on this uh, PCR data here, we actually estimated about 10% uh, of the alleles will actually, or ca actually carry the deletion here. And what is also very important in that case is when we look now at, again at toxicity, you can see here that we get a significant increase in cell survival when we compare this config configuration here. So the cross-reacting with the autonomous sync fingers, you can see a significant increase from 40 to about 60% cell survival. So just to make sure that we really look at deletions, we actually sequence this uh, fragment here, and you actually get exactly what you would expect. So these are the two target sites here, separated by 170 base pairs. You can see here that the cleavage occurs here and here. And this is exactly what you see when we sequence here. You have a deletion of the intermediate sequence here. So um, this is as far as sync finger nuclease. Now I'm talking, I'm coming to the last part of my talk, talking about AV vectors that we use to actually shuttle in the components. And what we actually wanted to know in that case, again, is can we increase gene targeting by transiently arrest the uh, cells in the G2 phase. The data I showed you before with vimblastin, everyone who works with vimblastin knows it, it's ex extremely toxic to the cell. So we were looking for other components that would do the job. And the other question we ask here is, can we actually influence this balance here between 
the donors being used for targeted integration or the donor being used for random integration events. Now, I don't have to give any introduction on AV. This is, again, a proof of concept approach where we try to correct the mutation in GFP, and this is a single integrated locus here in different cell lines. And then we infect these cells with an AV vector that now has a donor, contains a donor molecule, as well as an expression cassette for the nucleases. And what you can see in these cells, we used UTOS cells, HeLa cells, and HD1080 cells. In HeLa and HD1080 cells, we could correct after infection about 5% of cells. In UTOS cells, you can see the correction frequency was about 70% after infection. So meaning 5% is already fine, we thought, but 70% is just amazing. Just with, with a single infection, we can actually correct 70% of cells. And meaning gene targeting seems to be very strongly cell type dependent. And we know from published data from uh, Luigi Naldini, for instance, that when you move from cell lines here to primary cells or to stem cells, that the gene targeting frequency is much, much lower. So then in iPS cells, you can expect the gene targeting frequency of about 1 in 8,000 cells when you use zinc finger nucleases. And without zinc finger nucleases, we, he, they weren't able to see anything. So this is a very strong point here. And I think it's really worthwhile looking into this and figuring out what actually makes a difference in these frequencies here. Now, as I said, the second point is, can we transiently arrest the cell cycle without damaging the cells too heavily? So we looked into different uh, chemicals here. And these are just a few that we tested. This is the cell cycle profile here. This is the control assay in HeLa cells in that case. You can see here, this is the regular cell cycling. And what you can see here, one of the uh, chemicals that we like the most is actually indirubin, which is CDK2 inhibitor, and should not intercalate into DNA at this concentration here. And what you can see here, you can see a very strong G2 arrest after day one, and when you release the cells again, when you take off indirubin, they go back to cycling very rapidly. And you can see here, one day after release, they're back to normal cycling. So as I said before, HeLa cells is not a cell line that actually does a lot of gene targeting. So meaning that in that case here, in a dose-dependent way, as you can see here, we could actually increase the gene targeting frequency from 0.5 to about 3.5%. So a seven-fold increase in HeLa cells. This is all based on AV infections here. Now, we also tried to rescue EGFP in U2S cells. Just to remind you, U2S cells are very prone to actually support gene targeting. But also in these cells here, you can see an increase. This is now with the control endonuclease or with the zinc fingers here. You can see an increase in the gene targeting frequency depending on what uh, chemical you use. Now, I know that you work with AV, and you probably also know that when you use chemicals, that they also in induce, uh, let's say, increase the transduction frequency of AV. So just as a control, that we are not just looking at AV biology, but as a true gene targeting event here. We actually repeated this with plasmid DNA. And what you can see here, using the same chemicals here, you can see an increase uh, in gene targeting frequency using SC1, so from here to here, or from here to here, but also with the same finger nucleus from here to here. So meaning that it's not an AV based effect that we look at, it's really a gene targeting based event that we look at here. So the last point is really risk benefit analysis, meaning that you insert a donor DNA into the cell, but you want to make sure that it's used for gene targeting, not for random integration. And what you again see, these are the three cell lines that we worked with. In HeLa cells, you can see that about the ratio is 1 to 10, meaning that we have one gene targeting event per 10 random integration events. In HD1080 cells, the ratio was 1 to 1. And in U2S cells, the ratio was about 20 to 1. So meaning that you had 20 cells out of, uh, sorry, um, you have 20 gene targeting events per one random integration event. And we actually thought if we, again, if we induce a G2 arrest, a transient G2 arrest, that this might actually improve the targeting ratio, but this was not the case. As you can see here, we actually got very different results. With indirubin, just again, we have a slight improvement in HeLa cells. We got a decrease in the targeting ratio in HD1080 cells, and in U2S cells, it didn't do anything. So meaning that the prediction that the G2RS will be beneficial 
to actually have more gene targeting random integration was not true, as you can see here. So just to summarize what I told you, I think I hopefully could convince you that zinc finger nucleases are a versatile tool to achieve targeted genome modifications in a variety of cell types. I showed you mostly data from cell lines, but we also now st uh, started to work with primary cells and also pluripotent stem cells. Um, computational assays that we performed in the lab are very in very good agreement and I think are, are, can be really be used as a predictive measurement to actually see whether zinc fingers work. And they were in very good agreement with the in vitro data and with the, the data that we got in, in cells. And this was, was used actually to identify these autonomous zinc finger nucleus pairs, which we used then to insert a targeted chromosomal deletion. What I also could show you is that zinc finger media gene targeting is strongly cell type dependent, and it can be increased by transiently modifying the cell cycle. And when we do, when we look at the ratio between gene targeting and random integration, we actually saw again that this is strongly cell type dependent, but the, that the cell cycle doesn't seem to have any influence on this ratio here. And these are just some numbers that we achieved with zinc finger nuclease. We can get up to 50% gene targeting in cell lines or up to 50% gene knockout in cell lines. And as I showed you before, about 10% chromosomal deletion when we use two pairs of zinc finger nucleases. So I'm, I have to say I'm very happy that I have very good people in my lab that do all this work. And I have also very good collaboration partners here. And uh, most of the work that I showed you was, was done in collaboration with Keith Chung. He made all the same finger nucleases that I showed you here. And this has been a very fruitful collaboration. And I hope it will go on. And I also have to mention all the sponsors of our uh, work here. So this is the, the German Research Foundation, the German Ministry of Education Research, and of course also the EU. And with that, I would like to conclude, and I'm ready to take some questions. <laughs>